to this wonderful ministry. So may God continue to bless you as you give of yourself for the gospel. Good day to be here and open the Bible. What we believe here at Marco Presbyterian Church is that this is where we get to see Jesus. We open this each week, and we've been in a series in the book of Philippians. So if you have a Bible, there's one in your seats if you want to join us in the book of Philippians. And what we're doing is finding more and more that God is giving you and me an opportunity to have a joy-filled life. We found that it's a life that is inside out, it's upside down, it's poured out, and we also find that it's pretty easy to get wrapped up in ourselves. It's pretty easy to get sort of inwardly focused, and we look at the problems of the world, we look around and we start to think pretty quickly, at least I do, I don't know if you're with me on this, that the problems of the world could be pretty easily solved by by me, because if I, you know, if I were a part of that, if I were directing it, then uh, you know, I could fix that problem. And if you're with me on the joy challenge, how many people are doing the joy challenge? You've got the card. Maybe you're doing it through marcochurch.com. Uh, maybe you're on the Marco Church app, which I would recommend because then you actually get reminders. And in fact, I got a couple of reminders. If you're with us again on, on Friday, which was the 12th, and Saturday, which was the 13th, there were two related joy challenges. You guys remember this one? One was to help somebody put their groceries in their car, and the second one was to help somebody with their shopping cart. Remember that? So how many people uh, shop at Costco? Any Costco shoppers here? If you don't know Costco, just know that going on to the Costco property is sort of like going into a war zone. There's a war the, the victory is attained when you purchase the item and you want to, I mean, the objective is to fill the cart as full as possible so that you have as many items in the cart to take home. That's a win at Costco. And so you can imagine the parking lot at Costco and getting a parking space and getting a cart. And so I'm with my two youngest children, they're four and seven, and they're coming out. We're coming out of Costco on Friday. We've got a load of uh, You know, we were winners. We loaded up the cart, and here we are in the parking lot on the way to the car, and I'm thinking, man, you know what? There's a twofer here. I think I could probably help somebody with their cart and their groceries, both. I could get it, and I could see down the aisle um, a cart. It was this guy's getting into his car, and instead of putting the cart away, about 100 yards away, I could see he popped it up onto the curb. Now, in the Midwest where I come from, that's not a thing, but apparently here in the Florida, southern Florida at least, that's a thing. I don't know, you just leave the cart there. I've heard it said, oh, I'm just leaving it there for the next person. I, no, I don't, I'm not buying that, no. You've you got to put your cart away. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, that guy's a jerk, but I'm going to go ahead and put his cart away. And I'm getting closer, and uh, again, four-year-old, seven-year-old, there's a car pulling up behind me, blinker on. She wants that spot. Guy is uh, the guy that left the cart on the curb. He, he's in the car now, pretty nice convertible. His wife and he are in the car, and they're pulling out now. So, in fact, not only am I going to get his cart, but I can't go anywhere because he's backing out and in the way. And so I can't go anywhere. I'm stopped. Lady here, blinker on, once in. And now there's another car coming toward us, also wants the spot, and this is a war zone. And so what's happening here is this guy's p- backing out. And in my heart, in my mind, I'm thinking... This is, this is ridiculous, you're in the way. And right as my emotions are boiling over, a guy comes from my right-hand side and has his own cart. And he's on the way to the place where you return the carts. 
and he grabs the guy's cart. He puts it on his little cart thing, so he's got, this guy's got two carts now, but he makes a point of making sure that the driver knows by saying this, oh, I'll just grab your cart too, as he drives around the back of the convertible to try to take it over to the cart. And I'm just thinking, see, that's exactly what needed to happen in that situation. Guy's backing out, woman over here, blinker on, guy coming this way. Well, suddenly, woman over here pushes the button, window comes down. That cart was for me. He left it for me. I had totally misread the situation. Guy who takes the cart misread the situation. And in fact, what was happening is that guy in convertible really had left the cart for the woman because she needed it. Now, what we're doing as believers is attempting to live a life where we're getting ourselves out of our own minds and living lives that are, instead of being self-righteous, we want our righteousness, and you could say it like this, our joy, to be rooted in Jesus. Because this happens every day, and you all, each of us, have moments in the day that are just like my shopping cart moment, where we're judging and you know driving or in the shopping mall. Those tend to be the most common, but all over the place, we're making um, our lives filled up with moments of self-righteousness, which are, in fact, draining our joy. John Piper, a uh, famous pastor and theologian, a writer, he, he says it like this, joy, this is what we want, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the Word and in the world. Now, I was so much dependent on my own self-righteousness that in that moment I could not see the beauty in the Word and in the world. John MacArthur says it like this, spiritual joy is not an attitude dependent on chance or circumstances. It is a deep and abiding confidence that regardless of one's circumstances in life, all is well between the believer and the Lord. You see, what's happening here is that our joy is rooted in Christ alone because when we try to root it in ourselves, Another word for that is simply self-righteousness. What we're trying to do is be dependent on ourselves to live a life that's joy-filled. Our understanding of, of, of life and even our personal patterns, um, what, what we're doing is we're not actually seeking joy. What, what we're doing, especially in the United States, but I think this is a global epidemic and it's been an eternal one really since the beginning, that is that instead of seeking joy and being filled with Christ, what we're trying to do, in fact, is satisfy our deepest longings with things that only really produce short-term happiness. And what we do when we do that, in fact, is make the problem worse. We make our problems worse. I don't know if you saw the fog last week. Did anyone see? There were a couple days in a row where there was great fog. I think of the Christian life as something like if you're, if you're sitting in the midst of the fog, and you know Jesus, then even though there's a fog of circumstance around your life, you know that there is joy and love and wisdom and hope. But if you're in the fog and there's no God, then what's, what else is there? there? There's yourself, and you begin to think, well, what else is there in the world? I can't see past the fog. You see, our joy is in Christ alone. There's no other person. There's no other path. There's no other... Uh, theology, there's no other psychology that in fact satisfies our deepest need, and that is for God. And so what we want to do as a people again is, um, if you will, stand up with me. We'll read God's Word from the book of Philippians, if, if you can and are able to stand. We stand simply out of respect, but we also stand in your heart. So if you would prefer to sit, uh, we have somebody celebrating 102 years this September, and I know somebody else uh, up here in the front, I won't name names because he'd get embarrassed at celebrating his 90th birthday next week. But uh, we're a people who love to read the Word, and so let's read this. I'll read it if you would follow along. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision. 
who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Please be seated and I'll pray for us as we dive deeply into the Word. Father, we're grateful that we can open the Bible and read about You and Your, your Son Jesus and Your Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray today that You would indeed transform us, get us out of our self-righteousness and live lives that are joy-filled because our life is in Christ. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've seen time and time again Paul uh, repeat certain themes. And we've called this series The Joy-Filled Life because what we see even here uh, is that he likes to talk about joy. And why does he like to talk about joy? He, He believes, Paul, that joy is rooted in Christ. And so he's going to go far, not only to extend this idea, but to defend the idea that, that righteousness and joy are in Christ himself. And so you can look in your Bible at chapter 3, verse 1. He already says, finally, um, by the way, I pointed this out in the last service, Paul says, finally, and this is chapter 3, verse 1, there's still two chapters to go. So I think he's a preacher. He says, finally, but there's a lot more to come. But he says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. And so if you were to look at Philippians, both before and after this text, you'd see there are all kinds of mentions, not only of the word joy, but you can see the word rejoice. Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, make my joy complete. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me as well. You might know chapter 4 as well. It says this, some of you memorize this, rejoice in the Lord Always, again, I will say, rejoice. Paul loves to rejoice. He's, remember, singing even in the middle of the prison in Philippi. He's remembering that instance as he's sitting probably attached again to a jailer writing to the book, uh, writing to the city of Philippi as he's in probably Rome. And so he is a guy who's rejoicing. He's a guy that knows joy. And look at the next verse. So he's rejoicing. He's all about joy. And then he says this, look out. For the dogs. Now, if you've read some of the Bible, you know that the word dogs does not show up much in the Bible. And in this particular place, this is a put down. This is an attack on a group of people who are either preaching Christ out of false motives or they're preaching a different gospel. And he says that they're dogs, but he also says this next phrase look out for the evil doers. Now, this is a pastor writing to a group of Christians who's very energized. So much so that he's going to call people dogs. Why is he so concerned? Well, if you want to answer the question, what does it mean to live a joy-filled life? Another way to say that is, what does it mean to be a Christian? You might say, hey, read Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11, because here's what's going to happen today. Paul, for us, is going to set up three marks of being a Christian. Three marks of the Christian faith. What does it mean to be a Christian? He's going to do that, in fact, only from verse 3. And then later on, Paul will use his own life as an example and illustration. And at the end, verses 9, 10, and 11, he'll, in fact, unpack and define for us what it means to be a Christian. The most important message of the gospel is contained right here in this section. And Paul is so energized to protect it because other people are trying to speak a different gospel. It's something like us trying to get wrapped up in doing good 
And all of that gets defined by the moment where I try to put away a Costco shopping cart, which, by the way, was a big fail on my part. That's not the Christian life. Your actions in that moment are not what define you as a Christian. My worth is not in what I own. There's another line in there which was appropriate. Yesterday we had our soccer tournament here on Marco Island. You were driving by Winterberry and wondered why all those young families were on the soccer field all day long. Soccer tournament. My worth is not in whether I win or lose. Even for a little 8-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old, we can begin to get wrapped up in our self-righteousness. And you know this too. I'm going to use the shopping cart as a metaphor, as an illustration today, because you have your own moments of self-righteousness. And if you believe in Jesus, those moments of self-righteousness are moments for us to repent of and to trust the Lord more. And if we're willing to follow that pattern, that what ends up happening is that we not only show the marks of the Christian faith, but we end up also telling others about what it means to be a Christian, which is to believe in Jesus Christ. And so what we can do right now is just see the three marks right here in verse 3 is the first one. Right away he says, for, you know, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, those other people outside who mutilate the flesh. What was that? It was circumcision. That was their guarantee or their, their entrance into the kingdom of God. That was a mark or a sign and a seal in the people of God in the Old Testament times. But now because of Jesus, Paul says this, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. The first mark of a Christian is that we serve by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who circumcises our hearts. Ezekiel 36 and 37 say this, that I will give you, God saying this, I will give you not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. How do we gain entrance into the kingdom of God now? It's not by doing good things. It's by believing in Jesus Christ. First mark of a Christian is that you serve by the Spirit. That Costco shopping cart metaphor, you can also say this, and this is a Scottish author of the 18th century. He says that, that one example, one example is worth a thousand arguments. A picture, you know, it's worth a thousand words. One example is worth a thousand arguments. Why? Because you can see God living in a person as he or she lives in Christ. How do you have a joy-filled life? You have a life in Christ. And the first mark of that is that you are serving by the Spirit. That's a, a humble acknowledgement that the only way to Christ is by His grace. It's through your faith in Jesus. The second mark, though, is right here in the same passage. He says that we worship by the Spirit of God, but we also glory in Christ Jesus. Other translations say boast. What do we glory in? What do we, what do we tell the story of? And it's Valentine's Day. Hope you didn't forget. If you love someone, what do you do? You talk about them. You buy gifts for them. You serve them. If you love yourself, what do you talk about? <laughs> We've all encountered folks who love to talk about themselves. A Christian doesn't talk about themselves more than he talks about God himself. The second mark of a Christian is that we boast in Christ. In fact, Paul in Galatians says it this way, Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and out of the world. So what we see is that the first mark is that we serve by the Spirit. The second mark is that we boast in Christ and not in other things. And the third mark right here, Paul says it, serve by the Spirit, glory in Christ, and put no confidence in the flesh. And he's about to unpack this by giving us an example. He uses himself as an illustration of this reality that a Christian 
not only serves by the Spirit and boasts about God instead of himself, he also puts no confidence in his own flesh. And here's, here's the example Paul gives. He says, oh, and he says it kind of in a, in a funny, this is satire in the Bible. Uh, oh, my, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Also, if anyone else thinks that I, they have some sort of confidence, Paul just says, I have more. He's playing the bigger and better game here, and he's about to win because here's what he says. I'm circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He is the one person who almost, in a sense, deserves to be a child of God, according to the Old Testament Bible and faith in Christ. But what happens here is that he's putting up against all of these other people, the dogs, the mutilators of the flesh, the people that are demanding some other entrance into the kingdom of God. Paul says, no way. I would be the very first person accepted by that standard, but that's not the way into the kingdom. In fact, he goes on to say, whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And yes, that word rubbish, maybe you've heard in a sermon before, it does mean poop in the gutter. That's what he's comparing it to. Rubbish would have been what's flowing through an ancient Near East gutter, and it really does mean the poop on the street. He's comparing his beautiful worth, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as a Pharisee, he persecuted the church in terms of obeying the law. He's a zealot, a Pharisee. It's all trash compared to knowing Jesus, my Lord. The marks of a Christian are those. Paul goes on himself then to help us to see that a joy-filled life is in fact a life in Christ. And this is what he says. Be found in him, verse 9 and be found in Him. A joyful life is a life in Christ. And so just pause for a moment, and maybe you've heard some of these concepts, maybe you've, you're on board with me, great, maybe you don't like Costco, fine, don't care, but you're, you're tracking with me. The marks of a Christian, served by the Spirit, we don't boast anything except Jesus, we don't put confidence in our own flesh, but even if you've walked with me this far, and you believe in Jesus, you're still wrestling with sin. You're still a person who wants to get wrapped up in self-righteousness. And that's because you and I still live here. And yet our joy, our hope, is still in Christ alone. And Paul goes on to help us to see this more clearly. Remember, this is the doctrine, the part of theology that he is so concerned about that he's going to defend it by calling people dogs and evildoers and mutilators of the flesh. And then he compares his own greatness, probably one of the smartest people around when he lived, to street trash. But now he's going to tell us what it means to be a Christian. And the first one is in verse 9. Right away he says, be found in him. That's the overarching topic. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul immediately unpacks what it means to be justified. This is the word called justification. And our justification is a a one time, it's a status, it's a legal declaration from God that I am innocent of my sin because of Christ. It's a one time occurrence that's almost like a status. It happens immediately. And you can change your status by believing in Jesus. Are you justified then? Do you have a righteousness that comes by faith in Christ? In fact, just from Jesus himself, he says it like this in John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life. Okay, if the Son of God all of a sudden starts a sentence by saying, this is eternal life, maybe you want to perk up and pay attention what he says here, that they know you, he's talking to his Father, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What must I do to be saved, says Nicodemus in John chapter 3. What's the answer? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. How can you be a Christian? You're justified. Your righteousness is not your own. It comes from Christ alone. How can we be justified by believing in Jesus? And now you're, maybe you're thinking again, okay, I'm, I'm still with you, Pastor. I understand. I'm, I, I've read a little bit of the Bible. I understand. Okay, I'm justified. That means salvation or eternal life. How do I get eternal life? By believing in Jesus. Well, but, okay, I've done that. I'm, I'm, I'm past that. You might say I'm, you know, like I'm next level Christian. Okay, now, now you're talking self-righteousness. Now that's what I would be doing in the moment of the Costco shopping cart because now what's happening is that my, not just my sanctification, but now my, sorry, not just my justification, but now my sanctification, which is the ongoing process. Justification, status. Sanctification, now I have to wrestle with my sin. I'm still living here. So what do I do? Well, now I just depend, you know, I'm justified, I have eternal life. Now I just, you know, I just do my stuff. I go to church, I give well, I do good things, I put the Costco cart away, right? No, that, that's not what the Bible says. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. No, I don't, I don't, I don't want that. Becoming like him in his death. No, definitely, definitely don't want that. But yes, you do. And here's why. Do you want eternal life, which is not just justification, good relationship with God, status, but also sanctification, process by which you become more and more like Jesus? Okay, that, that sounds good. I like that. I'm on board with that. But what about this suffering and death part? Well, what happened to Jesus as he suffered and then when he was finished suffering and died? Relationship with God, broken for a moment because he paid for our sins. Father raised him from the dead. And Jesus even now, bodily and soul, present with God. Do you want that? Yes. Eternal life. Do you want that? Yes. Do you want God's presence? He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, yes, and yes. Okay, I'm on board. I'm, I'm jumping on board at least. I'm going to process this. Justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Sanctification also by faith alone. It's by His grace. It's by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. So sanctification process, justification status. But there's more in verse 11. He says that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Justification status, one time. Sanctification is a process by which we depend on God, even in the moment where we want to do good. Paul says, I want to do good, but I don't do good. And even when I don't want to do good, I, I'm just messed up. I need help. God gives it to us in the form of the Spirit working inside of us. But then there's a, another aspect, and that's glorification, which is to say raised with God. Future tense. Justification, sanctification, glorification. How? All. All by faith in Christ. This is what John says in the book of 1 John. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. He's writing to Christians. What's he want to say? That you may know that you have eternal life. How? By believing in Jesus Christ. What we see in this section of chapter 3 is a man who is energized to help others to see that Jesus is the big deal. He is the main thing. We can get wrapped up in our own self-righteousness, but we need to remember it's all about Him. It's all about Jesus. And so you've had opportunities like this maybe in your life where you've been out and you're praying something like this. Man, I, I really hope that this gets unpacked. I hope that I can live a life who, uh, of joy and show others Jesus Christ. And I hope that that's your prayer. I, I read a story about a pastor who did this in the orthodontist's chair. He's sitting in the orthodontist, and he's talking to the guy. Now he's getting to know him, and he's known him for a little while, so much so that the orthodontist begins to share, man, I, I, I love this one movie I've been watching, and, and uh, there's a problem. I always get to this one specific point in the movie, and I've seen this movie five times. I'm a little embarrassed to admit that, but I've seen the movie five times. He says, I always cry right at this moment. 
Now, pastor guy's sitting in the chair. Okay, this is a little strange. Um, you're telling me that you cry, a man, at a movie, and you've seen it five times. And he says, yeah, but actually, would you just come with me to the movie and watch it with me? I mean, we can go again, and it turns out you haven't seen the movie. You can come with me and see the movie. We can watch it to that point in the movie. This is not Valentine's Day, not a date, just buddies hanging out, want to go. They show up, and so they go. The guy says, okay, uh, you know, I, but wait, what, what movie? I, I don't even know what movie. <laughs> Orthodontist says, Terminator 2. Okay, uh, definitely a guy movie. That dates the illustration as well, about 30 years ago. And so what's happened now is the orthodontist has asked the pastor to go see a movie with him because he can't understand why he keeps getting emotional at a particular point in the movie. And so he goes to the movie and he watches the movie with his friend. And it turns out that the moment where he continues to break down and cry is the moment where the Terminator played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, gives himself up for his friends. He sacrifices himself for his friends. Now they have coffee later, and they recognize together that that moment is a moment that's moving because it is an echo of the real story, which is that there is a Redeemer, a Jesus, who bought our salvation. It turned out that the orthodontist came to Christ because of Terminator 2. But it was that moment that was an echo of eternity in his own heart and mind where he saw that there really is something to self-sacrifice. And it was a moment where he was able to lead the pastor, lead his friend to salvation in Christ. There are moments and echoes all over creation where you and I have that same opportunity to not only live joy-filled lives because we have life in Christ, but to show others hope in Him. Because one example is worth a thousand arguments. And we can win people to Christ simply by living in Christ. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we're grateful that you have called us to be a church who brings hope to people with the truth of Jesus. We want to be that people, and yet we know we get wrapped up in our own self-righteousness And so would you help us to repent of those moments while we lean on you for not only our salvation, our justification, but also for our sanctification as we become more and more like Jesus and for our future glorification when we get to be with you eternally without sin. Father, we're grateful that you have called us and are even now calling us deeper and deeper into relationship with you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. We're going to respond with actually with a couple songs this morning, a little different than we usually do. The first one is a really familiar one. drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand
the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave As we began by singing praise to our Father and um, Matt Papa, who's been leading us for a few weeks, actually introduced this a few weeks ago. Um, so it might be a new one to people, but as you kind of catch on, um, you can join in. We're going to cast our mind to Calvary, and we're going to praise the name of the Lord our God. I cast my mind to Calvary. Where Jesus fled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on a cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they Praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. 
shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on jesus face can we just sing oh praise one more time just the voices here we go oh praise the name of the lord our god oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh lord oh lord our god we are a people who go forth as joy-filled christians I want to challenge you still. There are 15 days, 14 days left for the joy challenge. Grab one of those cards on your way out. Go to marcochurch.com or the Marco Church app. What we want to do simply is be a people who bring hope to others with the truth of Christ. Now receive the Lord's benediction from Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Go in peace.